Hi, this is Ken Willis. I'm a sports columnist with the News Journal in Daytona Beach, Florida. I'm with Dinah Pulver, who is a staff writer for the USA Today Network. And Dinah helped out our coverage team at the Daytona 500 this past speed weeks, like she's done for several years. And this particular speed weeks ended in quite violent fashion. I'm sure everybody's seen the replay of the accident involving Ryan Newman on the final lap of the 500. Uh, Dinah and I were among our staffers that were there at the time and left uh, basically hanging for a couple hours awaiting word from the hospital uh, that uh, on Ryan Newman's condition. Uh, they reported non-life-threatening injuries. And uh, Dinah, I assume that still leaves a wide berth of what those injuries could be from, from mildly serious to very serious, I would think. It does. It, it, there's, a, there's a lot of possibilities out there for exactly what could have happened to Ryan in the car. Been a fair amount of speculation about that. The team certainly asked people not to speculate. There have been um, numerous injuries at Daytona Speedway before that involved broken necks, broken backs because of the force of their bodies against their restraint systems as their cars are flipped into the air and come back down. Since uh, Dale Earnhardt was killed on the last lap of the 500 19 years ago, and that launched the modern era, the revolution. In recent years, the, the, they're not strides, they're, they're plugging little holes, they're learning more about this, more about that. And it had gotten to the point where we fully expected Ryan Newman to, be, to at least be helped out of the car at most, since it was sort of crushed, they were gonna have to cut him out. But we fully expected him, as that wreck was unfolding, you expected at the end with him getting out of that car and walking to the ambulance for the mandatory ride to the care center. But, and, and uh, when he wasn't, and when say a half hour or so later, he was being hauled away in a speeding ambulance, it really took us all aback because we had thought, we almost thought the cars were getting as bulletproof as they could, as they could get them. But we learned that there are still areas where the, of uh, high danger and they found one because he was upside down on the track and got hit on the driver's side by the car of Randy Le or Corey LaJoy. And I don't know how fast Corey LaJoy was going, but he was going somewhere between 150 and 200 miles an hour, I, I would say. And the force of that impact threw his car into the air a second time. He had already yeah. been upside down rolling in the air or fl flipping, and then he went up into the air again. And like Ken said, fans were waiting in the stands. Fans were watching closely. They expected to see that that safety net you know being unrolled and maybe ryan you know crawling out of the car being helped out and once they flipped the car over they cut the roof off and the fans were hoping to see him stand up and immediately across the stadium i think and even in the media center and out there in the social media world all thoughts turned to dale earnhardt because dale earnhardt also was killed on the final lap of the daytona 500 and people immediately started drawing comparisons between the earnhardt collision and and ryan's wreck i think if you're looking for daytona comparisons uh, you got to go back a year earlier than dale earnhardt to the jeff bodine crash in 2000 and the, and the very first truck race that they had at daytona in 2000 pretty much the same part of the track and pretty much the same uh, same sequence of events. He wrecked hard. He had was already wrecked and was spinning and got hit a second time, got hit by a car coming past him that, that just drilled him and sent him into a whole nother wreck. And there was very little left of his truck at the end. His, his truck looked a lot worse than Ryan Newman's car, even after they cut Ryan Newman's roof off to get him out. But uh, and Jeff Bodine ended up with non-life threatening injuries and and uh, he raced again. And uh, today he lives in retirement down in the southern end of Brevard County, about an hour and a half south of Daytona Speedway. So, you know, we're, we're all hoping, obviously, for the same uh, same conclusion here. Sure. And, you know, among this, um, there's been a lot of talk about the safety the safety advances since since Earnhardt. I know they made the Hans devices mandatory. They have added, have continued to add safer barrier in uh, around the walls of the Daytona International Speedway, and then they've added safer barrier in other locations. And Ken, what are some of the other safety measures they've taken? Well, they've done a lot to the car itself and the cockpit. The, the, they're almost in a womb in there compared to the cars in 01 when Earnhardt was killed. If you could, looked inside that car, inside that cockpit, and then looked at today's cars, 
the the 01 era car looked agricultural compared to what you have today. Uh, it was just a seat basically in the roll cage and all that. They've added that the, the seat technology alone has added a tremendous amount of additional safety. Now you throw in the restraints, the, the the different seat belting that they have today through through tons and tons of testing with with uh, crash test dummies and, and the like. Uh, and helmets, and helmets too. Helmets and they got and the Hans device. The the two single greatest uh, pieces that have saved a lot of drivers' bacon has been that Hans device that keeps their head from continuing forward when they come to an abrupt stop. And the worst case scenario, it snaps the brain stem and they're dead. Uh, the other piece is uh, is not as simple, not as simple a piece of technology. It's the soft wall technology that's very expensive and that the, they cover every piece of concrete they can with it at, at the track. The outside retaining wall, the inside walls, they cover as much of that as they can uh, as they can, because if you leave any of that un uncovered, somebody will eventually find it. So those are the two two areas that are the most visible because you see the driver wearing the Hans device and you see the. Uh, safer barriers out along the tracks. Ne uh, I don't. I don't think either of those. The safer barrier, the soft wall technology, came into play at the beginning of that wreck last night because when he slammed into the wall, which triggered him to get upside down and airborne, uh, mm -hmm. that that would have been a lot worse if that was exposed concrete. Um, but I think uh, just speculating, which of course we shouldn't do, but we do it anyway. If I'm thinking of the the equipment, the modern equipment that might have come into play for him last year, two things: the additional crush panels that they tied the car specifically over there on the driver's side, and those new restraints that they have beside the drivers that come out beyond their ears uh, in front of them. It, it hampers their peripheral vision, but they've added mirror mirrors for that to help overcome that. Peripheral vision is an issue, but it keeps their head from slapping violently horizontally it, it keeps them in this little cocoon and uh and i think that those two things the crush panels and the the head restraints on the side that keep them from violently going horizontally i think those things uh i'm just you know as an outsider watching this uh layman at best i think those are the two most important pieces of safety equipment from last night certainly that came into play last night i think i think you're right Although, you know, over the years, Ryan has kind of become, a, he's been a vocal um, proponent of continuing to take additional measures, right? Yep. He was fined once for saying something after a wreck in Talladega. Well, he's, you know, he's a, a mechanical engineering grad from Purdue University, which makes him an outlier in the racing community because most of these guys focus on racing and only racing from a very early age. So he's uh, very well spoken on these things. And, and also, you add to that, that he's very opinionated and does not mind sharing his opinion. He has uh, he has talked about it, but he's not alone. Uh, a lot of racers, Tony Stewart comes to mind and many others don't like the style of racing that, that they have at Daytona and the sister track, Talladega, because uh, the, the rules package leads to the equalization of the competition. There, that means you're going to have bigger packs of cars at a very high rate of speed. The better cars can't separate themselves from the lesser cars. And you get the huge wrecks that we see here in Talladega. And if you keep inviting huge wrecks, you obviously uh, increase your chances of somebody, uh, you know, getting dinged up, hurt, or worse. Right. And this wasn't, this is definitely not Ryan's first time in the air. I mean, he was in the air in 2003 in Daytona, right? Yeah, he got, that's another thing that crossed my mind last night was when, as the wreck was unfolding, my first thought was, I'm glad he didn't get into the fence, the catch fence that's above the concrete wall. I said, thank God he didn't hit that fence because we've had issues with that and fans getting hurt. And then my second thought was, wow, he's, this has been a long time, but he has crossed in front of the front grandstands on his roof before. It's not his first time. Uh, and then after that, you're not really, you, we've gotten so used to them walking away from these things. You're just not as concerned as in retrospect we should have been. And uh, recovering recovering from these wrecks has been kind of, you know, I've interviewed several drivers. Um, there was a driver critically injured in the Rolex in a, in a, by hitting a car several in years ago, car, Mimo, yeah. Gidley, yeah. Mimo Gidley. And Mimo has had a really long, arduous recovery and is still not back to where he was. But then, 
you know, another another racer was injured a couple of years ago in the truck wreck, had a had a broken back and wore a brace for a while and was able to start driving again later that season. So there's a there's a wide variety of how long any kind of recovery might take. Well, however long it takes and whatever safety advances might come from this, because a lot of safety advances come from from accidents uh, just, throughout history. The major ones have followed disaster. And uh, and uh, this appears that it's no disaster. I'm sure that Ryan thinks it was, but uh, you know, hopefully it's a uh, you know he recovers and all is well. But whatever happens, I'm sure they're going to take the black box. They're going to examine the cars, and they're something. They will find a way to try to bulk up that side and try to limit the possibility of that type of accident and injury happening again. And as all that unfolds, Diana, we will keep an eye on it and uh, get the news out there as it happens. I trust, right? Right. They, um, they, NASCAR confirmed last night that they had taken the cars of Corey LaJoy, who of course is the car that hit Ryan as he was coming back down um, from the first flip. And that car and Ryan's car have been packed up and are headed back to NASCAR's research and design facility in North Carolina, where they will put those cars through every kind of imaginal imaginable test with their equipment and their modeling and the things that they do to try to look for the weak points in the car or, or things that could be corrected.